Whether you're looking at work wheels, SSRs, or Watanabes, the Japanese culture is seen as the pinnacle of wheel manufacturing. In fact, Facebook groups and forum groups are dedicated to supporting Japanese wheel brands above all else that it's turned into somewhat of a cult, which is a bit weird, but if we're about it, so whatever. Either way, the documented Japanese wheel series is non-existent. You think I'm joking, I'm not, but guess what? I love anime movies. Well, that was a weird dubbing. Anyway, we're going to jump in like Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai to talk about Japanese wheels and the history of them. So strap in. Mom! Red Bull! Lying? Tart. Tangy. Green. Light. Diet. During the 20th century, Japan really didn't do automobiles that just like wasn't like a thing even if you break it down to like the wheel like Japan didn't really do that they weren't they weren't about it there was companies that would actually import in automobiles back in the early 20th century to help the Japanese culture understand really what it was all about you had different showrooms and people would go and they'd look at it and they'd be like so why would I buy that? In fact, Japan's first mass-produced vehicle was the Mitsubishi Model A, and they made 20, 22 of them. So how many should we make? What's my favorite song? Taylor Swift, you know what I'm talking about? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Whatever she's like talking about her age, you know what I'm talking about? 22? Da! You got it, guy. <laughs> And yeah, this is about wheels, but you have to understand that this is much different than the American culture, which had the automobile in the early 20th century. With Japan, they didn't. So the need for wheels was non-existent. It just didn't matter. Real growth for the automobile industry didn't really start until the Sino-Japanese War and ultimately World War II. The country itself it didn't, didn't really, didn't really go, didn't, it didn't go well for them, if you didn't know. And then they ultimately had to get a whole pass for anything the country wanted to do post World War II. It was kind of awkward. Anything had to go through the United Nations Council that they had at the time, which was called like the GHQ. And ultimately Japan really kind of was in this very peculiar spot. Imagine being the kid no one knew, having to do a hall pass for everything, having pretty much no money to do anything. And then at the same time, housing millions of like people in, in trying, try, it's like, it was like an identity crisis. Japan didn't know what to do with itself. And you did have wheel companies like Naper Japan hosted in Osaka in the early to mid 1940, 1945 area, but they were so extremely regulated that it didn't really allow them to do anything when it came down to actually producing wheels. And moving up into the 50s until the GHQ ultimately lifted a lot of restrictions and a lot of regulations, Japan really didn't have a big need for automobiles. Once the GHQ lifted all that, then it was like, yes, let's go do some shit. And then they did, it was kind of cool. They were like, hey, come out little guy, come back. You can, you can come hang with us again. We're not gonna hurt you. We're not in a war anymore. You can, you can come, you can come kick it with us. And the people that I was Japan, the, 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 the analogy is that I'm Japan and that's like commerce, right? As automobiles began to make headway, the need for OEM wheels began to actually exist. And because of the Korean War, prosperity really began to jump in to the automobile industry through wartime efforts and peacetime efforts. And ultimately, an actual desire for aftermarket and OE and OE plus wheels became a thing. It didn't take long to see an OEM demand come through for pretty much everything, whether it was motorcycles, tanks, trucks, cars, or those little three-wheeled things that flipped over all the time. And companies like NK or Enki, depending on how you want to say it, whether they want you to say it the new hip way or whether you want to say it how it's actually pronounced, decided to get involved in their respective field at the moment that they possibly could. Companies like NK and Naper began to develop those wheels for that market at the time, and for a pretty short time, it actually worked for them. And then Japan moved into the 60s and with it they began to actually be good at stuff you'd be surprised because they ultimately were like that one really skinny kid in tag that would always go into the geodisc dome because you couldn't fit in it because you were a little bit bigger metabolism hadn't kicked in yet and you couldn't squeeze through the holes faster than he could squeeze through the holes i still can't understand how ryan was able to do that in the third grade but we're just going to get past it even though it's been 20 years and i'm still f 
and pissed off about it. Japan was competing against international alliances like Chevy and Ford and Chrysler and all of those companies, but they were producing things that were different. They were minimalistic. They were small because Japan was small and America is big and Japan didn't need big. It needed small and versatile. And so companies like Mitsubishi and Nissan and Toyota really started to give it a run for its money. And for the most part, it worked relatively well. You had companies making all sorts of different stuff for the Japanese market. And because of the Japanese government, government's capability of giving tax reductions and different things like that and incentivizing through programs and tax deductions, these companies were starting to go faster and faster and faster. And because of that, you finally had wheel companies coming in and saying, hey, let's make wheels. But finally, after all of this, the Japanese guys actually got able to sit down, relax, enjoy a couple years of not being in a war and not getting shot at, not having things blow up. And they ultimately got to enjoy some of this new automobile culture. But just like anything with the grass green being and greener on the other side, people wanted to have something unique versus something that was original. Hey there, little guy. Weds is an iconic and original brand. They own companies like Wed Sports, Crans, Leon, Superstar, and Stylish Wheels. That last one's a little bit funky, but they were pretty much the iconic first aftermarket wheel company that specialized in making something different. In fact, they were one of the first multi-piece wheel companies that offered the L-Star, which is probably something that you didn't need to know, but now you do. At the same time, Hayashi Racing Equipment was getting started and getting established within the racing community of Japan because there was a lot of of growth in terms of that becoming a hobby for Japanese culture. And at the same time, Hayashi Racing Equipment also stands for HRE, which is a common misconception with Howell Racing Equipment, which is now HRE, which is a company that you know now of today, but that's the wrong video. And while Weds was one of the first companies to make forged multi-piece wheels, there were other companies coming in to make some of the first standard multi-piece wheels, super, Speedstar Racing came out with the Mark I or MK1, which was one of the first standard multi-piece wheels. And while the market continued to grow, the amount of companies making unique stuff with it also grew. And in the early 70s, business was booming. You had everybody coming in and making wheels. And in the early 70s, it continued to see that they really weren't going away. If you wanted to be involved in wheels, now was the time. As the market continued to expand way past expectations, there was only this little like, this little coal in terms of the international market that Japan was playing in. But as Japan kind of tried to figure out who he was, like that one weird kid in puberty that turned out to be a really good singer and then went to Hollywood and left your ass high and dry, it began to open up and the wheel accessories was born. You had companies not only just competing for an international market for wheels, but you also had it for accessories as well. And if you wanted to make a business and do things well, Japan was the bomb.com because just like the gold rush, anybody could get in there and could start making really whatever they wanted. Companies like Raguna Inc., Watanabe, and Rays all joined the fray in 1972 to 1973 to compete in some sort of specialty area. You had Rays Engineering making the strongest wheels to date, Watanabe producing quality specialty wheels for driving sport, and Raguna capitalizing on the OE and OE market, which pretty much means they were just being that like boring uncle in the basement that slept immediately after Thanksgiving because there was nothing else to do, and then he woke up only to leave, and then he was the same guy that never got you a Christmas present. And I just feel like I'm always telling you a lot of personal issues and it's kind of getting weird. I'm sorry. Then there was this one person that was like, wait, hold up. I can work harder than any of these people to make sure that my work shows through way better because my work and effort will make everything better than any competitor because my work is the best. Just like a random player three entering the game, work wheels came in in Osaka, Japan, 1977, and they absolutely dominated the market, kind of like that shy girlfriend in the bedroom that you weren't expecting. Work wheels was like the game for everything. They did all of the possible things you could potentially imagine from the fact that Gels is laughing behind the screen on my previous comment, but they made things for any diameter, any width, any offset, any PCD, any color, anything at all, and work wheels was like, a lot of what came before, but better, because they just were. Like they were really good at what they were doing, like really good. Like if I had a hat, I'd take it off. Like I'd shake that man's hand. I would fist bump 
even though I'm not a fist bumping guy out of respect. I would stand up to shake a hand and put the napkin in my lap at a four star restaurant because that's just how much I cared. Japan markets continued to grow. You had everything from lean management principles to companies like Toyota and Nissan and Mitsubishi knocking competition out of the park. And the wheel companies that were working with them were pretty much used under the same principles. And you had these companies doing everything that international companies were doing, but better, faster, and with slightly less po politics, mostly mostly because the 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 standard, it was just weird. The found just industry, it's internationally, there's different rules and regulations, you know, people's well-being, things like that. It's a big thing. So you have like a thick market and that's with like two C's, both caps. You had a great market strategy and you had people that like wanted to run your stuff and then you actually had, you know, the material to make the product. So things were going good and then something pretty cool happened. Tuner market happened. You had everything that was great about the domestic all the way into the import, which was something that was brand new for pretty much anybody at the time. Everybody that was running around with their big V8s and high emission testing Lincolns and lame straight car driving vehicles all of a sudden were kind of getting put next to Mazda RX-7s and Datsuns and Mitsubishis. And the market that was just solely for domestic finally turned into something that also had tuners. You had companies and people competing on multiple levels of what they liked, what they wanted to drive, and the wheels that went along with it. And everybody that was used to their dad driving some sort of big muscle car, the young teenage, you know, rebellious guy, didn't want that. And they ended up picking up an RX-7 or a Datsun. And as a result, the wheel market expanded it past just Japan and the people that ran the wheels domestically, it went all the way over into the United States. And that is really where it began to stick on and actually grow from an international place sort of things. You had people running works on everything. You had SSRs, Watanabes, you had everything you could possibly imagine. And while there were other Japanese companies that were also making wheels at the time, there was nothing quite like the fact that there were these companies making wheels for popular vehicles that were being used internationally. Wheels today have Japanese cues all over them. You see Workmeister influences and Watanabe 8 spokes in almost every single wheel catalog. The country with wheel manufacturers is practically synonymous with perfection and quality. Japan, they just, they're the cool kids on the block. And just like the grass is greener on the other side, us in America always want the that we don't easily get like skylines and supras and girlfriends and like stuff like that. And you just ultimately end up with these things that you want but can't get. And the wheel game is no different because these companies are iconic in their own right. And because of the tuner market and the fact that Japan actually wasn't getting beat down anymore in the mid 20th century, they actually started to make something. And because they are one of the massive biggest hubs of automobile industry in the world, it just comes natural that the wheel accessory market was short there behind. And you might be thinking that I'm missing brands like Kase, M Speed, Hayashi, Amistead, Lowenhart, or 326 Power, but those are all brands that go into the history of this story. Whether you want to know more about those companies is exactly and entirely up to your discretion, which is a big fancy word because Mario might be watching this, which means it's up to you to decide if you want us to talk about it. So our winner for last week's video is... Gels, that's you. <laughs> Ow, did you get that? Oh my god. Straighten up! Jesus! Alright, congratulations. Our winner for the sweatshirt is Kiops TV. You have one. You want us to talk about which one of us can make the best suspension wheel tire setup on a set budget, which is totally gonna be me. We're gonna film that video next week. Obviously, as you guys know, drop a comment below on what you want us to talk about next. And if you're interested in fitmanindustries.com, don't forget to subscribe. I'm Alex from Fitman Industries. Goodbye. I care about all of you. We'll see you later. Peace.